este año hemos tenido, o tendremos más bien, el honor de tener en este programa a la destacada y reconocida internacionalmente psicóloga Edith Eger. Ustedes me imagino, seguramente ya conocen, muchos han leído su libro, La bailarina de Auschwitz, que estuvo internacionalmente en los rankings, en los más leídos hace muy pocos meses. Ella es una sobreviviente del holocausto y su testimonio junto a su experiencia profesional nos iluminarán en estos tiempos que estamos viviendo tan complejos. La hemos invitado a tener una conversación con el destacado psiquiatra chileno Patricio Fishman, quien es profesor de Yale y director de la Fundación Fundamental. Antes de iniciar esta conversación, queremos agradecer también a la Fundación Memoria Viva, que nos ha ayudado en establecer el vínculo con Edith Eger y con su directora Karen Kotner, que también va a participar en esta conversación. Muchas gracias a Patricio, nos quedamos contigo. Doctor Edith Eva Eger, dear Eddie. Um, hello, I am so thrilled. I'm so happy and honored and grateful to be able to have this conversation with you again after a year of our first conversation. As you know, your personal, professional life and, and journey and, and struggles have brought light and meaning to so many of us. So from uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, in a cold day of winter, we give you our warmest welcome. And we look forward to our conversation, to being further illuminated by your strength and your wisdom. But uh, first, please give us a few minutes so that we can introduce the topic of our conversation and uh, yourself to uh, our audience. Again, you know, I'm Patricio Fishman. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a professor of psychiatry at Yale and the medical director of Fundación Fundamental, the Mental Health Foundation in Chile. And we would like to thank Centro Memoria Viva, the live memory center uh, of the Jewish community in Santiago, Chile, uh, which has made this possible. And I'd like to ask uh, one of her, one of the founders of this center, Karen Kotner, to tell us about it. Muchas gracias, Patricio, por tu presentación. Eh, en nombre de Memoria Viva, que es un centro de memoria que se aboca a registrar las historias de los sobrevivientes de la Shoah, que es el holocausto, y de los refugiados que se albergaron en nuestro país, y hacer herramientas pedagógicas para todo nuestros estudiantes y profesores y al que esté interesado en el tema. Eh, doy las gracias por esta oportunidad y espero cumplir con mi rol humildemente y poder tener una conversación muy significativa hoy. Gracias Patricio y gracias a la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción y a todos los que nos están escuchando. El Centro Memoria Viva cumple un rol tan importante hoy en día porque <coughs> no solo mantiene viva las almas de 6 millones de judíos que fueron exterminados eh, eh, pertenecientes a distintas naciones de Europa, sino que a través de sus programas educacionales intenta instruir a estudiantes y a todos los chilenos en la importancia del respeto, la tolerancia, la empatía por, por ideas diferentes, por formas de, de vivir diferentes, por formas de rezar diferentes. Lo, lo que es tan importante porque hoy en día, eh, y lo sabemos, hay tanta intolerancia, tanta dificultad en aceptar que otras personas piensen diferente. Así que felicitaciones porque la labor de vuestro centro es muy importante, tanto para la comunidad judía, como para Chile, como para el mundo. Ahora quisiera darles la, la bienvenida a, a los miembros de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción. Eh, Ustedes son tantos individuos, eh, sin embargo, confluyen en un colectivo articulado, de compleja articulación, porque están aquí con nosotros eh, desde los miembros de los distintos comités de la Cámara, eh, ingenieros, calculistas estructurales, proveedores, instituciones financieras que hacen posible vuestra labor, instituciones gubernamentales, que, que son las encargadas, imbricando toda esta malla, de generar una infraestructura en nuestro país. Estructuras que en realidad 
nos permiten a nosotros vivir en ellas, trabajar en ellas. En, en estas estructuras que ustedes construyen, se desarrollan y se despliegan nuestras vidas emocionales y nuestras vidas eh, relacionales. Y es tan importante de nuevo porque estamos hablando de lo que ustedes hacen, que es construir. ¿Y por qué es tan importante hoy en día? Porque justamente aludíamos a que eh, personas que piensan diferente muchas veces tienen la idea de que no, no se puede construir sin destruir. Y hay veces que en lugar de considerar remodelaciones, flexibilizar, agregar, se pretende justamente destruir y destruir lamentablemente sin una visión de futuro, eh, sin una visión de presente y sobre todo sin una visión del pasado. Y vamos a aprender de Edith que a menos que nosotros seamos capaces de revisitar nuestro pasado, de entenderlo, de tolerarlo, de aceptarlo, no podemos vivir sin prisiones mentales en nuestro presente y proyectar un futuro. Así es que bienvenidos. Eh, es muy significativo que sean ustedes quienes permiten esta conversación con Edith Eger. Edith, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as a mental health professional, I often have the experience of hearing from my patients that they remember something they considered so important that I had said years ago that has been kept in their minds. And sometimes they say that it's been life changing. That at my level is so significant. It, it, it provides me with a sense of accomplishment, but also it's an enormous responsibility. At the level that you are, you have influenced hundreds of thousands of people How does it feel to carry that responsibility? You know, uh, I think when you talk about philosophy um, Thursday, uh, probably a week later, you and I are going to say it's a good question because we really don't have the answers. And <laughs> I have lots of questions. And um, I was at the grocery store And I picked up, I looked over, and there was a picture of Anna Frank. I'm telling you, my life has changed since then. I'm remembering the little girl who, who looked outside and said, all I see is, uh, is violence and all I see is murder. And I still want to believe that people are basically good. And so I have been going through this before I'm talking to you today, uh, that because I, I say what I lived. And, and that is my truth, if not necessarily anybody else's truth, that uh, part of me was left in Auschwitz, and I'm more and more aware of it now. And I don't want to overcome it. I want to come to terms with it. I want to know that I am a very compassionate listener, and I'm very happy to to be with you in a cold Chile. No one can control the temperature of your heart. That's true. And let me just say a few words about you. The fact that you're a psychologist, that, that you were trained and acquired your doctorate in the University of Texas, and then that you are professor at the University of California in San Diego, where you live in beautiful La Jolla, and that your life has not been as beautiful as it is all through. That when you were 16 years old, living in Kosice, a small little town in between Hungary and what used to be Czechoslovakia, now is Slovakia, you and your sister Magda, beautiful pianist. Um, your middle sister, Clara, was uh, lucky to be uh, at the Conservatory of Music in, uh, in Budapest. You, Magda, and your parents were imprisoned by the Nazis and put in a stadium, a ghetto, and then transferred in a cattle train to Auschwitz, which was right. called a concentration camp, but it was a 
extermination camp. And the very first day that you arrived there with Magda and your parents, you were separated, Magda and you from your parents. And they were sent to the gas chambers and then cremated. And then you asked, Magda and you asked the guards where your parents were. And do you remember what the answer was, what they told you? Yeah, she pointed at the chimney and said, you better talk about your parents in past tense because they're burning there. So today it's very important for us to acknowledge that dependency can really breed depression because people who were waiting for someone to come and liberate them, it didn't happen at all. And so I think that Auschwitz, uh, I call it an opportunity for me to discover my inner resources because the Nazi could throw me in a gas chamber any minute. When we took a shower, we didn't know whether there water or gas is going to come out. So it is a very difficult time that we are now in a limbo because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so I'm hoping to really use the experience I had in Auschwitz to look for the gift and look for the light and never ever give up hope. There is hope in hopelessness. Right, and, and that the very first day your inner resources were put to test because Dr. Mengele the angel of death who carried out right. experiments, horrible experiments uh, with people, uh, visited the barracks where you were and um, they asked you to dance in front of him. Yes, yes, uh, my teacher was there um, and she pointed me at the finger and said, you know, you do, you do as you are told and no, don't question. And I ended up dancing for Dr. Mengele. I actually was taking care of one of the twins that he experimented on. And really? he died of kid kidney failure. And um, he, he was one of those delayed victims and was not really able to live a full life. But I think today is so important because we want to talk about freedom and there is no freedom without responsibility. And that is very important because even when we were liberated and people would go through the gate, I noticed that after a while they would come back. I think it's very good to read Eric Fromm, Escape from Freedom, because children always want freedom, but they don't want to take the responsibility with it. That's true. That's very important. And I think your mother told you while you were in the cattle train that they could strip you of everything except for what you had in your mind. And what you had in your mind when you were asked to dance was being at the Budapest Conservatory or the opera dancing, isn't it? I, I love the way you pronounce Budapest. You speak Hungarian? Oh, uh, no, but my, my mother is an Austrian survivor, <clears throat> and uh, I've uh, been able to meet a lot of people that came from Austria and, uh, and Hungary as well. So I say Budapest. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. I'm very impressed. Um, today, we really talk about transcendence. Today, we talk about that self-love is self-care and it's not narcissistic. But when I was dancing with Dr. Mengele, I discovered something that he could not touch, and that is my soul. I think it's important for us to really have a good talk with our soul every day and make a decision how we can regain our power, regain our power, because we cannot change what's happening. We cannot change the past. I can change the way I think about it and what I pay attention to. So think right. about your, it's very, very important because what you think you create. You cannot and change your past, but if, I'm sorry, go ahead, sorry. If you can get rid of two words for sure, always and never. I always do that. I'm never going to be uh, happy. Um, just get rid of it and just say up to you now, I did this and now I'm going to do something else. 
change is synonymous with growth. Absolutely. Now we cannot change the past, but I think unless we visit and revisit our past and and understand it and tolerate it and accept it, we're going to be in mental prisons to live our present and our future. Yes. Yes, the mental prisons uh, that we create. When I was at the university, I was asked to give a lecture. And I prepared the lecture and I'm doing the lecture and all of a sudden a guy walked out. I say to myself, I'm no good. My accent is bad. You know, I was already on the guillotine. I, 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 the guy came back, he just had to go to the bathroom, but of course I did not do that. Well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. A couple of years later, I was discussing the psychology of the rapist, not the victim. And I had some illustrious psychiatrists with me. And you know what? There were about 900 people in the audience. And the same thing happened. Someone got up and walked out. This time I said to myself, it's too bad he's leaving. I'm good. <laughs> Not what happens. It's what you do with it. Right. Right. Patricia? Um, yes, please, Karen. Um, I would like to talk with you about the inner struggles. Yes. Um, we all know that you have a special gift. I mean, you are a gifted person. Um, and you have been wise enough to overcome your trauma and transform it in, into an energy and a positive way of life. How did it start? Do you remember the turning point, the right moment when you realized that or you die with all the trauma or you transform this in a positive energy and message? Well, I was 16 in love and my boyfriend told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. <laughs> so I was, I was in love, just remember that. And by the way, being in love is not love at all, you know? It's a chemical that happens, and that you can get that from chocolate too. That's why only people reach for chocolate. It can lead to a loving relationship. I, uh, you know, I'm not knocking it at all, but I think it takes a long, long time, many times, to discover that that um, this is not this is not what is really going on. And um, one of my TED Talks would be very appropriate to listen to. I began to work with PTSD, actually, and I had two paraplegics sent to me with the same symptomatology, same diagnosis, uh, but very different responses. One of them took that victim's mentality. He cannot be a victim without a victimizer. So he was nothing but blame, full of blame, full of anger and uh, the other person said to me you know doc i am in a wheelchair and and it is really amazing what i'm discovering that being in a wheelchair gives me the opportunity to look at my children's eyes much closer mm -hmm. and reach the flowers and here i am in a white coat Okay, a title is Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatrist. And I, I feel like an imposter because when I came to America, I went totally underground. If you ask me who I was, I would say, who do you want me to be? You know, you become a very, very good, uh, um, yes, a liar. And so I think it's very, very important is uh, for you to tell me that I came to a point when I told my therapist that uh, it's time for me to go back to Auschwitz. And he told me to go and ask my sister, and I did. And she told me I was an idiot, and not only an idiot, but a masochist as well. So you see, it's not what happens. And uh, 
my sister didn't want to have anything to do with the past at all, uh, as if it happened to somebody else. So there was a lot of denial, a lot of denial going on. Uh, and also minimization, oh, it wasn't such a bad thing. It was a very bad thing. Mass murdering. I watched uh, 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago, and a little guy, not more than five feet, was a, the youngest persecutor at the at the trial, Nuremberg. the Nuremberg trial. A lovely man. One day, I hope to give him a big hug. And um, yes, yes, yes. So there are wonderful people still alive and uh, believing that there is hope that we can unite and form a human family so we can finally make it in this wonderful world. Eddie, the, the first many years, actually a couple of decades after you arrived in the United States, I understand that you felt, thought, and behaved as a victim. And then, and then you were able to break through that. And uh, how did you understand that you had to visit your past, your pain, and your sorrows, and not just harbor it inside in order not to contaminate your children and your family? The word understand is very strange to me. I, I don't understand so many things. Uh, I'm not into the logic so much. Uh, I am into the heart more. And I go and ask questions like, um, how did you feel about it rather than, let me help you to understand something, you know, because the mere uh, I don't want to talk about your brain and my brain. You, you know all that, that we are built differently. The corpus sure. callosum is different with women and men. So I am into the spirit. I'm into, into see in what way I have the total control of how I will think about anything. And so instead of yes, but, I like to say yes, and I could have died and I wanted to die. I was very suicidal after I was liberated because I had a broken back and they put me in a bed and they put me in a cast and I could hardly breathe. And I had five kinds of typhoid fever. I never thought I'm going to make it. And then there was a guy who brought me Hungarian salami, and the rest is history. You know, people asked me, Did you love your husband? I said, Love? What do you mean? I was very hungry, and he brought me Hungarian salami. Uh, so, so was Bella? Very, was Bella the one that brought the salami? Yeah, he was a partisan in the Czechoslovakian mountains, and he had TB. I did not. Um, he died of TB. It came back after 43 years. So mm. I think it's important when people say you went back to him. No, I did not. I was a child when I married him. I was very hungry, so I married him. I was very skinny, so I married him. But the second time I was a woman to a man. Mm. I'm so glad you mentioned this because so many times we ask our patients and we ask ourselves, how do you feel? And we'll respond from the thinking process. And you ask them again, how do you feel? And they say, well, I'm thinking that. Perfect. Perfect. They, they, uh, everybody can have a wonderful way of thinking rather than feeling. You can say, I think I have to go downtown and buy a present for my mother's birthday. You know, that's not a thought. Uh, I, I mean, that's, it, it is very important to think before you say anything. And one of the things is most important at my age, I like to be kind. I like to be a passionate, very compassionate listener. And I even had a white supremacy boy 
who was part of the David Koresh in Texas. Wow. Yeah. And he got up and he told me, it's time for America be white again. How do you think I felt? And he's so all the so there is a difference between reacting or responding. It's um, important. So with it, I work. Yeah. I work in the field of memory and trauma and Shoah Holocaust. You said many times that you are working so very hard in order that this tragedy will not happen again. But I work with the same spirit, but I think it's a dream or no, because it's happening all the time or, or I'm being too negative. Well, love is not what you feel is what you do. I think, I think uh, daddy is really a wonderful person to really talk to the children and see how what the children respond is not what we say is what we do okay the children want to know how do you talk to their mother how do you make breakfast in bed to her and make a bubble bath and and to be able to really have respect but anti-semitism has been when i went to school as a young girl and i was told i am a christ killer so it has been with us um scapegoating the book to read is by uh, by um, max max weber max weber the capitalism and the protestant ethics referring to the jews as a pariah so you have to come to a lie and uh, plato was talk about uh, you have to think of a lie a big one and then you repeat it, repeat it until people believe it. So when I was interviewed by uh, Larry King, uh, Ahmad Dijidat was interviewed and Ahmad Dijidat told Larry King that the Holocaust did not exist. And so Larry King was interviewing me and uh, he wanted to know whether anyone ever experienced kindness from the Nazis. And I said, I do, I do. Because it was April 1945 when we were put in a German village and we were told that if we leave the premises, we're gonna be shot right away. But my sister was so hungry. She told me if I don't get anything, she'll die. And, and I didn't listen to anything or anyone. So I went out at night and I saw some carrots in the next garden and didn't take me a long time to jump. You know, I was a gymnast. And then when I was climbing up with the carrots, I heard shooting. And I thought, OK, I, I'm being caught and I'm going to die. I think it was one of the most important moments there is no way I could ever forget those eyes. Probably he was looking at me and then turned the gun around and pushed me inside. And the following day he came and he wanted to know who dared to break the rules. And, you know, I'm crawling to him and telling him that he takes out a little loaf of bread and told me you must have been hungry to do what you did last night. Wouldn't it be nice if I could meet that man today? Yeah. Yes, there was yeah. kindness. I did experience it. So that's why it's important really to think before we start being afraid so much. Fear is unfortunately not going to bring us love. Fear and love does not coexist. When you have fear, you have no love. We're not born to fear. We're not born to judge other people. You know, we are born with love and joy, and most of all, passion for life. For so many years, Eddie, you had to block your feelings. And, and when one blocks painful feelings, I think the pipeline of the 
good feelings also gets blocked. Um, yes. And you also concealed some of the pains in order not to perhaps uh, have your children become aware of what you were going through. What broke that down? What, what was it that allowed you to, to take the journey back? I think very important for us to look at what we call today the ego. Uh, ego, which is, is the person I create, which is a false self. Dr. Right. There is a little girl there shaking that you're going to find out that I'm none of that, that I'm a scared little girl and I better go back to Auschwitz and, uh, and uh, catch up with that 16 year old and stop running. Right. And so I think it's very important for us to check in with us and see how congruent we can be, how we can think about our thinking and pay attention what we're paying attention to. So angry, anger is not a primary um, feelings. Underneath of anger is a lot of more feeling, but most of what most of it is fear. Right. Not anxiety. Anxiety, of course, is about thinking but that we are feeling. We have to go through the rage. See, there is no forgiveness without rage. Just remember that. You got to shake that fist. You got to scream it out because what comes out of your body will never make you ill. Hungarian women will tell you don't breathe your pain into your breast. Mm -hmm. That's a very a Hungarian statement of women they use all the time. Think about your thinking. It's so, so very, I do that. I do that. And I welcome you to come to me and work with me because we're going to do three things. We're going to thinking, grieving, and feeling you cannot heal what you don't feel so mm -hmm. when i am with the third year residents at the <clears> university <throat> um, medical school they're very good at not rushing and uh, uh, talking about grief and handle it with anti uh, depressants no it just cry it out scream it out and then you feel better. So what comes out of your body will never make you ill. Hungarians also have another saying, which is don't put your butt in two seats, which is something uh, you mentioned. What, yeah, what do they refer to? <laughs> don't try to divide yourself in too many ways. Yes, you can't sit on, um, have here and have there. And um, that's very good. Um, they also say you cannot dance on two weddings at the same time. There are lots of <laughs> yeah, try to be hundred percent. When I'm with you, I'm with you now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you, and I'm telling you that there was that sixteen-year-old girl who really didn't know how to have faith in life. People say, I believe, I believe, I believe, but believe, it doesn't mean that you have faith. So to me, it's very important to know what kind of life you lead. Because right now I see, I see books in the back of your wonderful chair. And when I was in Oprah, I was in a library that was given to her when Maya Angelou died. So I was surrounded with books and books and books and, and Oprah. And um, she was asking me, how was I liberated? And, and it was a wonderful experience for us to really know that the book is so important to have. And the Nazis, right. you know, learning all the books. Uh, but I think the books are important in Chile and my book is in your library. And how can I be not happy that I can talking to you now through Zoom? Yeah.
have the Zoom. I don't have to get dressed. All I have is a nice cascada. <laughs> cascada, yes. Beautiful. Well, Eddie, so, I have to say that last year, Marianne said, that you always dress very elegantly, that she's never seen you on jeans. Yes. This comes from your father, uh, who yes. apparently was... My father, my father said to me that I had the best, best figure out of three girls, and he's going to dress me, that I'll be the best dressed girl in town. And so, Papa, here I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Eddie... Edith, I, I love when I when I listen that phrase that you never are in jeans. So I, I have been listening to you very carefully and in many interviews, and I'm wondering how about women? All our struggles as me, because sometimes we feel that we have to be in two parties as a, at the same time. We have a lot, a lot in our plate. And since the world, our role has changed so much, our responsibilities and everything, how do you connect with these struggles we have as women in our society today? And there is a difference between have to and want to. Have to are things without which we cannot survive. We have to breathe. See, I think there is a big difference to really ask yourself, do I really have to do it? Do I have to do it now? And have your priorities. And if you're single, write down all the things you would like to have from a life mate, and you become that person. The probability that you're going to attract what you put out increases. So if you want a kind person, you, you don't ask, how are you? That's a stupid question. I never ask um, my patients. I say, gee, it's good to see you. I missed you. OK? I think you provide an atmosphere. I think we women are very good at providing the atmosphere in the home so people are not competing or dominating, but cooperating and work as a team. You know, when you have one child, you can think of Russia, there is a wagon called the Troika. There are three wheels to the wagon. And if one of them doesn't go, the other two doesn't either. So it's very important to, as I mentioned, the word transcend, to go beyond the me, 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 and commit ourselves to each other, because all we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. Eddie, uh, you survived um, so many instances in which you were so close to death. And now, yes. as I think you've mentioned, you are in the evening of your life. You're about to be 94 in September, I believe. And how do you live your life now that it's getting a little closer to death. I think young, and I live in a present. I can only touch you now. Mm -hmm. And you, and you tomorrow is not yet. Good. I live in a present. So you enjoy when you go dancing with Jean, when you go to restaurants, when you cook wonderful chicken, paprika, and goulash. You got it. I had it. I had it a couple of weeks ago um, to the faculty and uh, the wonderful, wonderful students uh, at the University of, of uh, Medical School in La Jolla with uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Zizuk and brilliant psychiatrist right. who knows all the medications from A to Z. <clears throat> Talking therapy many times does nothing. Mm -hmm. And also, talking therapy doesn't do any good. Talking therapy, any positive thinking does no good unless it's followed with a positive action. 
right. Because life takes place not in the therapy session, but outside the therapy session. So it's not only what you work in therapy, but what you do in life. So what's yeah. your understanding of the difference between guilt and shame and remorse? I find shame is very awful. I was shamed in school. I was put in a corner. Um, shame is to me very unfortunate because we grow up and then we end up shaming ourselves and taking responsibility and feeling the guilt and the shame. I think it's okay to feel the feelings but not to really personalize it because anybody who is angry in the English language, you're going to hear the word you. You are stupid, you are naive, you, you, you. And then you say to yourself, I cannot change what's outside of me. So the more they talk, the more relaxed I become. And I'm practicing my low frustration tolerance level. See, you're a shrink, not a stretch, right? I mean, <laughs> love it. You're a stretch, not a shrink. <laughs> you also Eddie, mentioned that. Um, no, I, I would like to ask her, Edith, when was the last time you felt sad? You you're felt overwhelmed or you connect with the sadness or I, or never? I have been. I, I am looking at also life as an opportunity that suffering makes me stronger. So I think there is a great deal to be said that suffering is feelings and it's okay to really feel feelings and knowing that it's temporary. Have you looked at your birth certificate? Does it say life is easy? Children want things easy and they want it now. They don't want to wait for anything. They don't want to wait for anything. I want it now and I want it easy. No, life is mm -hmm. not easy. Life is very complicated. You can make it easier, but I will never tell you that life is easy. We all have. So be a good uh, for you. Sorry, we all have different roles that we play throughout our lives, and some of them are still alive. You you speak about a family of roles: the child, the adolescent, the adult, the older, wiser person. Um, tell us a bit more about that, please. Well, one thing I can tell you that I have three children, five grandchildren and seven great grandsons. I have a pair of twins. Ah, ah, Wonderful. Ah. That's it. The internal family. You have a whole family within you. Find that little girl, find that little boy. And you tell that little boy that you will never ever abandon because the biggest fear of a child is the fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. And we'll do anything to belong to the family. So we give up ourselves, we give up our true self, we give up our genuine, wonderful, one of a kind, unique, authentic you. She's, he's waiting for you. So buy a beautiful uh, um, frame and next time I see you, I want you to show me your little girl and your little boy because you are the one who will never do anything to harm that little family that you have within you. No one can take anything from you unless you allow it. So you have a protective shield I hope I can give it to you that I discovered in Auschwitz that I was able to look at the guards with pity, feeling sorry for them, that they unfortunately were brainwashed and they are wearing a uniform and throwing children into the oven. It's very important to understand that never in the history of mankind such a scientific 
and systematic annihilation of people existed. It's not comparable. It's very unfortunate that genocide is still with us. Very, 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 very true, unfortunately. I'm working with someone who experienced uh, in Rwanda terrible genocide, mother being killed and raped. So uh, Jewish people don't have the monopoly on suffering. And, but suffering, Absolutely. yeah, I can tell you that for us to talk this morning and starting my day, I know in the evening I'm not going to feel very satisfied in my deathbed that yeah. I gave to the world, not only survived, but I did the high kick for you and I gave you a choice because the more choices we have, the less you're going to feel like a victim. Right. You, you nourish us. You, you shine light on us. And, and like Leonard Bernstein said, uh, there is a crack in everything and there is a crack in ourselves. And that's uh, how light gets in. And we all have cracks. And your light gets in when we have a chance to hear you, to, to listen to you. So, so thank you again. Eddie, uh, you've played so many roles in your life. Uh, you've been, of course, daughter, sister. You've been mother spouse, therapist, writer, um, speaker, yeah. um, lover, yeah, uh, a dancer, uh, an Olympic great gymnast. Mother. Great, great mother, great, great grandmother, right. So which are those roles that you have enjoyed the most? I like to see myself as a guide from victimization and from darkness to light, from prison to freedom, and the biggest prison is in your own mind, as your mother said, as my mother said, and the key is in our pocket. All we have to do is reach for it. It's up to us how we're going to let go of one thing. The Torah said, after one year, leave the dead alone. Some people can not realize that they keep going to the cemetery when they have other children at home, thinking maybe maybe in this family, you know, it pays to die because you get more attention uh, that way. So don't, not to do anything, but develop a way that you have a balance between working, loving, and playing. And don't forget the playing. Don't forget the playing. You, you spend a long time with your children. I had a father with 10 children, and they made a date, 20 minutes, and then you do what the child wants you to do. It calls Asus Ordenes. I am Asus at your ordinance. service. Yes, see. <laughs> Don't say, let's do this or let's do that. That's very bossy. How about, because I know you are a believer that you walk every day with God in your heart, in your mind. But how about someone who sits in front of you in your in as therapy and say, I'm not a believer? How do you do you try to, to open that window? What how do you do it? Because faith was something is the, it is something so important to you dealing with atheist patients well um they still have a belief yes uh, <laughs> they still believe in that there is is no such a thing as god i um uh, i i consider uh, everyone i know i studied with carl rogers and give everyone unconditional positive regard. What they do or what they say, that's another thing. But your being is good. Your being is God. You just put a lot of unfortunate things on it. Uh, but with, there is no such thing as a bad girl and a bad boy. And yet there is evil in the world. Not to deny that not to be delusional about it. Well, yeah. I, I think she was asking whether 
you try to get people to have a belief in something? I don't come from an agenda. I really don't come. I meet people where they are and I treat them as if they really were what I think they could be. The question I may ask them, is this the best you can do? And you can talk to yourself every day a few times too. Is this the best I can do? Because if you're going to have a Belgian <coughs> chocolate, you're going to want to eat one chocolate every day. You decide I'm going to have one chocolate every day. And guess what happens? That little voice in you tells you, oh, come on, life is short. And then you end up eating everything. I'd like so to you, try and, and, and answer that, Eddie, if you allow me, because uh, some people believe that as therapists, we will influence uh, people in their core beliefs. And uh, it's happened to me when I arrived in Chile that some families were concerned that I was Jewish and I could mess around with their values and, uh, and, and their beliefs. And actually, we center on who the person is, uh, client-centered therapy, who the person is in front of us and we work with who they are. We don't transmit who we are. We, yes, we Patricia, I understand that. I understand, but you can imagine when someone says that one pillar of my transformation is to believe in something bigger than me. And when you have a patient that even he, he or she doesn't believe in something outside of him, anything, it's very difficult to make that transformation so and sometimes so you can role... refer them to the appropriate person in that case a priest or a rabbi but, I'm but i think not as a professional about... no but i'm not talking about faith in in something bigger like god something that how do you manage to have again faith faith in life faith in something that will take this negative and traumatic experiencing something positive how do you manage to to transform this without faith i i accept the fact that i'm human that means i'm limited i'm not superhuman or subhuman i make mistakes and therefore i give up perfectionism because when i'm perfectionistic you have to do something just right that's what happened to my granddaughter. She was in a class where the IQ started at 145. And I went to visit the class and the teacher called my granddaughter, my little red caboose. You know, the, the last, the last cabin in wagon the of the train, right? Yeah, so, so Lindsay decided that she cannot really do well because she doesn't have it. To, to be able to stay. So she was about to leave that class. And I had a talk, the first time I ever talked about the Auschwitz to my granddaughter, Lindsay. And I was good, believe me. She went back to school and then she ended up in La Jolla at the Bishop's School. And when it was time to write letters to colleges, and you have to write your autobiography. Guess what the title was? When the caboose became an engine. Mm -hmm. So so one of my ideisms, my daughter will tell you, is are you revolving or are you evolving? Wonderful. I think it's very important to look at the butterfly and go through the ages and stages of our development. If you want to read about Piaget, that he would be a good person to do that as a Swiss psychologist. So I think it's very important to have knowledge, not information, but to have knowledge. And to me, to me, it's so good that you're talking to me that we don't come with an agenda. We're not here to change anyone except examine your thinking about everything because your thinking will create truly what you think. 
I think it's so wonderful that you say this because we, as you say, we're humans and we have to be humble. And, and the more we know and, and the wiser we become, I think we realize that we are not the ones to tell people what they have to do. Um, yeah. We can only be guides, as you say. Where do you want to go work, walk? Perhaps I can walk with you. You know, someone told me yesterday that she looks at her husband and she wants to vomit because he forgot her birthday. And she is so upset. But you know, yeah. men like compliments. Yeah. It's not going to help you. Um, criticism will never ever bring out what you want. I think it's very important for us to have a big heart and the most obnoxious person becomes our best teacher. Um, the truly amazing gift that you have provided with is the fact that you lived, you went through incredible pain as, as a youngster, as a child, you suffered so many losses and you were able to be resilient. And then for the next two decades, you were able to conceptualize what you had gone through because you went through it emotionally, all right? You didn't have the intellectual acumen that Dr. Frankel had as he was a 30 something year old psychiatrist already. So you were able to conceptualize and as you say, not overcome, but come to terms with the experience subsequently. Get rid of two things. Get rid of guilt and get rid of worry because one is in the past and one is in the future. You see, when you're guilty, you tell yourself what you could have done and should have done. My parents had tickets to go to America and they never did. So you see, it's, it's good for you to, to make a decision whether you're going to be in the back seat of the car, because when you are a child, you're in the back seat doing whatever you're doing there, messing around, but somebody is taking that wheel. So right. you have to do the decision whether I want to be a child or an adult, because as an adult, you still feel like doing many, many things, but, but it's not really uh, good for you. So get rid of childish part, but find your childlike part. Right. Uh, My understanding is sorry. that children, sorry. children go to heaven. So be childlike, be playful. And, uh, yeah. and I hope you're going to find that little girl and that, find that little boy and, and tell your family, I want to have a new beginning. <clears throat> um, Evie, I know, I know that you love cooking and you love dancing. I saw you in a master class dancing in front of a huge audience in the Netherlands, right? I love it. <laughs> yes. When was the last time you cook or you dance just for the fun of it? I mean, Let's put music and dance. Just for the fun of it. Just for the fun of it. Uh, um, I think every time I do cook, it's for the fun of it, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I never throw out anything. So if you take me out to lunch and dinner, I'm going to probably come home with a doggy back, even if I don't eat it, but I can't throw out any food. <laughs> Even now. Because you are very thin. You are a very thin person. You are not. I have small bones. Tiny. I have small bones. I have small bones. But I think people uh, suffered more in Auschwitz, like my sister, who was heavy. And uh, so I would save my bread and give it to her the following day and telling her I'm not hungry because she suffered much more from hunger than I did. So after a while, 
you get so used to not eating. I can tell you, at least for two weeks, I got nothing. Nothing. Not even water. I was talking about joy and food and dancing. How do you relate yeah. with these amazing and beautiful things, even today at I, your age? I was telling you about Gandhi that I lectured in the Museum of Gandhi in Johannesburg, South Africa. And there is one person who brought down the whole British Empire without any bloodshed. That is a hero of mine and a big one. Well, who do you consider heroes? Uh, because some people think heroes are those that have no fear, but I think you think otherwise. I, I, I actually like Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt. Um, what's her name? Eleanor. Eleanor. Eleanor Roosevelt is certainly a woman that I admire. Uh, she didn't have time to be jealous. Oh, no, she had her own ways. She made a name for herself. Um, I really like Eleanor Roosevelt a great deal. I wish I could have had the opportunity to tell her that in person. But I know mm -hmm. Tova, who did her on Broadway, and Tova, <laughs> who did it on my book. Yeah. And it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful for me <clears throat> to know that I can always come to Chile, and in a cold weather, I'm going to be surrounded with warm hearts. Of course. Well. Eddie, um, we cannot choose to vanish the dark, but we can choose to kindle the light. And again, exactly. you always bring light into our lives. And this cold winter day, you brought your warmth, your wisdom, you. and we're so very grateful and honored to see you again. And I hope we can talk again when your book with uh, Hungarian recipes is uh, published. Okay. Yes. yes, yes. Hopefully it's going to happen when my daughter is going to be more cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> we'll speak to Marianne about that. Okay. Please well, do. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eddie, thank you. Katie, thank you. Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello.